book the seventh chapter four of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon chapter four valentine's skeleton the idea of this visit to the sussex village by the sea seemed delightful to every one except gustave lenoble who was still in town and who thought it a hard thing that he should be deprived of diana's society during an entire fortnight for the sake of this sickly miss halliday for the rest there was hope and gladness in the thought of this change of dwelling charlotte languished for fresher breezes and more rustic prospects than the breezes and prospects of bayswater diana looked to the sea air as the doctor of doctors for her fading friend and valentine cherished the same hope on valentine hawkehurst the burden of an unlooked-for sorrow had weighed very heavily to see this dear girl who was the beginning middle and end of all his hopes slowly fading before his eyes was of all agonies that could have fallen to his lot the sharpest and most bitter not ugolino sitting silent amidst his famishing children not helen when she would feign that the tempest had swept her from earth's surface on that evil day when she was born not penelope when she cried on diana the high priestess of death to release her from the weariness of her days not agamemnon when the fatal edict had gone forth and his fair young daughter looked into his face and asked him if it was true that she was to die not one of these typical mourners could have suffered a keener torture than that which rent this young man's heart as he marked the stealthy steps of the destroyer drawing nearer and nearer the woman he loved of all possible calamities this was the last he had ever contemplated sometimes in moments of doubt or despondency he had thought it possible that poverty the advice of friends caprice or inconstancy on the part of charlotte herself should sever them but among the possible enemies to his happiness he had never counted death what had death to do with so fair and happy a creature as charlotte halliday she who until some two months before this time might have been the divine hygeia in person so fresh was her youthful bloom so buoyant her step so bright her glances valentine's hardest penance was the necessity for the concealment of his anxiety the idea that charlotte's illness might be nay must be for the greater part an affair of the nerves was always paramount in his mind he and diana had talked of the subject together whenever they found an opportunity for so doing and had comforted themselves with the assurance that the nerves alone were to blame and they were the more inclined to think this from the conduct of dr doddleson on that physician's visits to miss halliday mrs sheldon had been present on each occasion and to mrs sheldon alone had the physician given utterance to his opinion of the case that opinion though expressed with a certain amount of professional dignity amounted to very little our dear young friend wanted strength and what we had to do was to give our dear young friend strength vital power yes er um that was the chief point and what kind of diet might our dear young friend take now was it a light diet a little roast mutton not too much done but not underdone oh dear no and a light pudding what he would call if he might be permitted to have his little joke a nursery pudding and then the old gentleman had indulged in a senile chuckle and patted charlotte's head with his fat old fingers and our dear young friend's room now was it a large room good and what was the aspect now south good again nothing better unless perhaps southwest but of course every one's rooms can't look southwest a little tonic draught and gentle daily exercise in that nice garden will set our dear young friend right again our temperament is nervous we are a sensitive plant and want care 
and then the respectable septuagenarian took his fee and shuffled off to his carriage and this was all that mrs sheldon could tell diana or nancy woolper both of whom questioned her closely about her interview with the doctor to diana and to valentine there was hope to be gathered from the very vagueness of the physician's opinion if there had been anything serious the matter the medical adviser must needs have spoken more seriously he came again and again he found the pulse a little weaker up the patient a little more nervous with a slight tendency to hysteria and so on but he still declared that there were no traces of organic disease and he still talked of miss halliday's ailments with a cheery easy-going manner that was very reassuring in his moments of depression valentine pinned his faith upon dr doddleson without organic disease he told himself his darling could not perish he looked for dr doddleson's name in the directory and took comfort from the fact of that physician's residence in a fashionable west end square he took further comfort from the splendour of the doctor's equipage as depicted to him by mrs sheldon and from the doctor's age and experience as copiously described by the same lady there is only one fact that i have ever reproached myself with in relation to my poor tom said georgie who in talking to strangers of her first husband was apt to impress them with the idea that she was talking of a favourite cat and that is the youthfulness of the doctor mr sheldon employed of course i am well aware that mr sheldon would not have consulted the young man if he had not thought him clever but i could lay my head upon my pillow at night with a clearer conscience if poor tom's doctor had been an older and more experienced person now that's what i like about dr doddleson there's a gravity a weight about a man of that age which inspires one with immediate confidence i'm sure the serious manner with which he questioned me about lotta's diet and the aspect of her room was quite delightful in dr doddleson under providence valentine was fain to put his trust he did not know that the worthy doctor was one of those harmless inanities who by the aid of money and powerful connections are sometimes forced into a position which nature never intended them to occupy among the real working men of that great and admirable brotherhood the medical profession dr doddleson had no rank but he was the pet physician of fashionable dowagers suffering from chronic laziness or periodical attacks of ill-humour for the spleen or the vapours no one was a better adviser than dr doddleson he could afford to waste half an hour upon the asking of questions which the fair patient's maid might as well have asked and the suggestions of remedies which any intelligent abigail could as easily have suggested elderly ladies believed in him because he was pompous and ponderous lived in an expensive neighbourhood and drove a handsome equipage he wore mourning rings left him by patients who never had anything particular the matter with them and who dying of sheer old age or sheer overeating declared with their final gasp that dr doddleson had been the guardian angel of their frail lives during the last twenty years this was the man who of all the medical profession resident in london mr sheldon had selected as his stepdaughter's medical adviser in a case so beyond common experience that a man of wide practice and keen perception was especially needed for its treatment dr doddleson accustomed to attribute the fancied ailments of fashionable dowagers to want of tone and accustomed to prescribe the mildest preparations with satisfaction to his patients and profit to himself dwelt upon the same want of tone and prescribed the same harmless remedies in his treatment of charlotte halliday when he found her no better nay even worse after some weeks of this treatment he was puzzled and for one harmless remedy he substituted another harmless remedy and waited another week to see what effect the second harmless remedy might have on this somewhat obstinate young person and this was the broken reed to which valentine clung in the day of his trouble bitter were his days and sleepless were his nights in this dark period of his existence 
he went to the bayswater villa nearly every day now it was no longer time for etiquette or ceremony his darling was fading day by day and it was his right to watch the slow sad change and if it were possible to keep the enemy at arm's length every day he came to spend one too brief hour with his dear love every day he greeted her with the same fond smile and beguiled her with the same hopeful talk he brought her new books and flowers and any foolish trifle which he fancied might beguile her thoughts from the contemplation of that mysterious malady which seemed beyond the reach of science and dr doddleson he sat and talked with her of the future that future which in their secret thoughts both held to be a sweet sad fable the hyperborean garden of their dreams and after spending this too sweet too bitter hour with his beloved mr hawkehurst would diplomatize in order to have a little talk with diana as he left the house did diana think his dear girl better to-day or worse surely not worse he had fancied she had more colour more of her old gaiety of manner she had seemed a little feverish but that might be the excitement of his visit and so on and so on with sad and dreary repetition and then having gone away from that house with an aching heart the young magazine writer went back to his lodgings and plunged into the dashing essay or the smart pleasant story which was to constitute his monthly contribution to the cheapside or the charing cross gaiety movement rollicking hairy lore queer like spirits were demanded for the cheapside a graceful union of brilliancy and depth was required for the charing cross and oh be sure the critics lay in wait to catch the young scribbler tripping an anachronism here a second-hand idea there and the west end wasp shrieked its war-whoop in an occasional note or the minerva published a letter from a correspondent in the silly islands headed another literary jack shepherd to say that in his imperial dictionary he had discovered with profound indignation a whole column of words feloniously and mendaciously appropriated by the writer of such and such an article in the cheapside while the sunlight of hope had shone upon him mr hawkehurst had found the hardest work pleasant was he not working for her sake did not his future union with that dear girl depend upon his present industry it had seemed to him as if she stood at his elbow while he wrote as pallas stood beside achilles at the council invisible to all but her favourite it was that mystic presence which lent swiftness to his pen when he was tired and depressed the thought of charlotte had revived his courage and vanquished his fatigue pleasant images crowded upon him when he thought of her what could be easier than for him to write a love story he had but to create a shadowy charlotte for his heroine and the stream of foolish lovers babble flowed from his pen perennial and inexhaustible to his reading she lent a charm and a grace that made the most perfect poetry still more poetical it was not achilles and helen who met on mount ida but valentine and charlotte it was not paolo and francesca who read the fatal book together but valentine and charlotte in an unregenerate and medieval state of mind the mere coincidence of a name made the sorrows of werther delightful the all-pervading presence was everywhere and in everything his religion was not pantheism but charlottism now all was changed a brooding care was with him in every moment the mystic presence was still close to him in every hour of his lonely days and nights but that image which had been fair and blooming as the incarnation of youth and springtime was now a pale shrouded phantom which he dared not contemplate he still wrote on for it is marvellous how the pen will travel and the mind will project itself into the shadow world of fancy while cankerous care gnaws the weary heart nay it is perhaps at these times that the imagination is most active for the world of shadows is a kind of refuge for the mind that dare not dwell upon realities who can say what dull leaden care may have weighed down the heart of william shakespeare when his mind conceived that monster of a poet's grand imaginings othello 
there is the flavour of racking care in that mighty creation the strong soul wantonly tortured by a sordid wretch the noble spirit distraught the honourable life wrecked for so poor a motive that sense of the something in this world amiss which the poet of all other creatures feels most keenly with grief and fear as his constant companions valentine hawkehurst toiled on bravely patiently hope had not deserted him but between hope and fear the contest was unceasing sometimes hope had the best of it for a while and the toiler comforted himself with the thought that this dark cloud would pass anon from the horizon of his life and then he counted his gains and found that the fruit of his labours was increasing monthly as his name gained rank among the band of young litterateurs the day when he might count upon that income which mr sheldon demanded as his qualification for matrimony did not appear far distant given a certain amount of natural ability and the industrious and indefatigable young writer may speedily emerge from obscurity and take his place in the great army of those gallant soldiers whose only weapon is the pen whatever good fortune had come to valentine hawkehurst he had worked for with all honesty of purpose the critics were not slow to remark that he worked at a white-hot haste and must needs be a shallow pretender because he was laborious and indefatigable before the beginning of charlotte's slow decline he had fancied himself the happiest of men there were more deposit receipts in his desk the nest egg about the hatching whereof there had been such cackling and crowing some months ago was now one of many eggs for the hard-working scribbler had no leisure in which to be extravagant had he been so minded the purchase of a half circlet of diamonds for his betrothed's slim finger had been his only folly charlotte had remonstrated with him on the impropriety of such an extravagance and had exacted from him a promise that this wild and monte cristo like course should be pursued no further but she was very proud of her half hoop of diamonds nevertheless and was wont to press it tenderly to her lips before she laid it aside for the night there must be no more such extravagance sir she said to her lover when he sat by her side twisting the ring round and round on her pretty finger alas how loose the ring had become since it had first been placed there consider the future valentine continued the girl hopeful of mood while her hand rested in his do you suppose we can furnish our cottage at wimbledon if we rush into such wild expenses as diamond rings do you know that i am saving money valentine yes positively papa gives me a very good allowance for my dresses and bonnets and things you know and i used to be extravagant and spend it all but now i have become the most miserly creature and i have a little packet of money upstairs which you shall put into the unitas bank with the rest of your wealth diana and i have been darning and patching and cutting and contriving in the most praiseworthy manner even this silk has been turned you did not think that did you when you admired it so mr hawkehurst looked at his beloved with a tender smile the exact significance of the operation of turning as applied to silk dresses was somewhat beyond his comprehension but he felt sure that to turn must be a laudable action else why that air of pride with which charlotte informed him of the fact End of chapter four valentine's skeleton book the seventh chapter five of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon at harold's hill the summer sun shone upon the village of harold's hill when charlotte arrived there with mrs sheldon and diana paget mr sheldon was to follow them on the same day by a later train and valentine was to come two days afterwards to spend the peaceful interval between saturday and monday with his betrothed 
he had seen the travellers depart from the london bridge terminus but mr sheldon had been there also and there had been no opportunity for confidential communication between the lovers of all sussex villages harold's hill is perhaps the prettiest the grey old saxon church the scattered farmhouses and pleasant rustic cottages are built on the slope of a hill and all the width of ocean lies below the rustic windows the roses and fuchsias of the cottage gardens seem all the brighter by contrast with that broad expanse of blue the fresh breath of the salt sea blends with the perfume of new-mown hay and all the homely odours of the farmyard the lark sings high in the blue vault of heaven above the church and over the blue of the sea the gull skims white in the sunshine the fisherman and the farm labourer have their cottages side by side nestling cosily to leeward of the hilly winding road this hilly winding road in the july afternoon seemed to charlotte almost like the way to paradise it is like going to heaven di she cried with her eyes fixed on the square tower of the old grey church she wondered why sudden tears sprang to diana's eyes as she said this miss paget brushed the unbidden tears away with a quick gesture of her hand and smiled at her friend yes dear the village is very pretty isn't it it looks awfully dull said mrs sheldon with a shudder and diana i declare there isn't a single shop where are we to get our provisions i told mr sheldon st leonard's would have been a better place for us oh mamma st leonard's is the very essence of all that is tame and commonplace compared to this darling rural village look do look at that fisherman's cottage with the nets hanging out to dry in the sunshine just like a picture of hooks what's the use of going on about fishermen's cottages lotta mrs sheldon demanded peevishly fishermen's cottages won't provide us with butcher's meat where are we to get your little bit of roast mutton dr doddleson laid such a stress upon the roast mutton the sea air will do me more good than all the mutton that ever was roasted at eton mamma oh dear is this our farmhouse cried charlotte as the vehicle drew up at a picturesque gate oh what a love of a house what diamond-paned windows what sweet white curtains and a cow staring at me quite in the friendliest way across the gate oh can we be so happy as to live here diana cried mrs sheldon in a solemn voice not a single shop have we passed not so much as a post-office and as to the haberdashery i'm sure you might be reduced to rags in this place before you could get so much as a yard of glazed lining the farmhouse was one of those ideal homesteads which to the dweller in cities seems fair as the sapphire sealed chambers of the house of solomon charlotte was enraptured by the idea that this was to be her home for the next fortnight i wish it could be for ever di she said as the two girls were inspecting the rustic dimity draperied lavender and rose-leaf perfumed bedchambers who would wish to go back to prim suburban bayswater after this valentine and i could lodge here after our marriage it is better than wimbledon grand thoughts would come to him with the thunder of the stormy waves and on calm bright days like this the rippling water would whisper pretty fancies into his ear why to live here would make any one a poet i think i could write a novel myself if i lived here long enough after this they arranged the pretty sitting-room and placed an easy-chair by the window for charlotte an armchair opposite this for mrs sheldon and between the two a little table for the fancy work and books and flowers and all the small necessities of feminine existence 
and then while mrs sheldon prowled about the rooms and discovered so many faults and made so many objections as to give evidence of a fine faculty for invention unsuspected in her hitherto charlotte and diana explored the garden and peeped at the farmyard where the friendly cow still stared over the white gate just as she had stared when the fly came to a stop as if she had not yet recovered from the astonishment created in her pastoral mind by that phenomenal circumstance and then charlotte was suddenly tired and there came upon her that strange dizziness which was one of her most frequent symptoms diana led her immediately back to the house and established her comfortably in her easy chair i must be very ill she said plaintively for even the novelty of this pretty place cannot make me happy long mr sheldon arrived in the evening bringing with him a supply of that simple medicine which charlotte took three times a day he had remembered that there was no dispensing chemist at harold's hill and that it would be necessary to send to st leonard's for the medicine and had therefore brought with him a double quantity of the mild tonic it was very kind of you to think of it though i really don't believe the stuff does me any good said charlotte nancy woolper used to get it for me at bayswater she made quite a point of fetching it from the chemists herself indeed exclaimed mr sheldon nancy troubled herself about your medicine did she yes papa and about me altogether if i were her own daughter she could scarcely have seemed more anxious the stockbroker made a mental note of this in the memorandum book of his brain mrs woolper was officious was she and suspicious altogether a troublesome sort of person i think a few weeks of workhouse fare would be wholesome for that old lady he said to himself there are some people who never know when they are well off saturday afternoon came in due course after a long and dreary interval as it seemed to charlotte for whom time travelled very slowly so painful was the weariness of illness now and then a sudden flash of excitement brought the old brightness to her face the old gaiety to her accents but the brightness faded very soon and the languor of illness was very perceptible punctual to the hour at which he was expected mr hawkehurst appeared in radiant spirits laden with new magazines delighted with the village enraptured with the garden enchanted with the sea full of talk and animation with all sorts of news to tell his beloved such and such a book was a failure such and such a comedy was a fiasco jones's novel had made a hit brown's picture was the talk of the year and charlotte must see the picture that had been talked about and the play that had been condemned when she returned to town for an hour the lover sat in the pretty farmhouse parlour talking together thus the summer sea and the garden flowers before them and a bird singing high in the calm blue heaven charlotte's talk was somewhat languid though it was perfect happiness for her to be seated thus with her betrothed by her side but valentine's gaiety of spirits never flagged and when mrs sheldon hinted to him that too long a conversation might fatigue the dear invalid he left the parlour with a smile upon his face and a cheery promise to return after an hour's ramble he did not ramble far he went straight to a little wooden summer-house in the remotest corner of the humble garden and thither diana paget followed him she had learned the language of his face in the time of their daily companionship and she had seen a look as he left the house which told her of the struggle his cheerfulness had cost him you must not be down-hearted valentine she said as she went into the summer-house where he sat in a listless attitude with his arms lying loosely folded on the rustic table he did not answer her you don't think her worse much worse do you valentine worse i have seen death in her face to-day he cried and then he let his forehead fall upon his folded arms and sobbed aloud 
diana stood by his side watching that outburst of grief when the passionate storm of tears was past she comforted him as best she might the change so visible to him was not so plain to her he had hoped that the breath of the ocean would have magical power to restore the invalid he had come to harold's hill full of hope and instead of the beginning of an improvement he saw the progress of decay why did not sheldon send for the doctor he asked indignantly the physician who has attended her he might have telegraphed to that man charlotte is taking dr doddleson's medicine said diana and all his directions are most carefully obeyed what of that if she grows worse the doctor should see her daily hourly if necessary and if he cannot cure her another doctor should be sent for good heavens diana are we to let her fade and sink from us before our eyes i will go back to london at once and bring that man doddleson down by the night mail your going back to london would grieve and alarm charlotte you can telegraph for the doctor or at least mr sheldon can do so it would not do for you to interfere without his permission it would not do echoed valentine angrily do you think that i am going to stand upon punctilio or to consider what will do or will not do above all things you must avoid alarming charlotte pleaded diana do you think i do not know that do you think i did not feel that just now when i sat by her side talking in ain rubbish about books and plays and pictures while every stolen glance at my darling's face was like a dagger thrust into my heart i will not alarm her i will consult mr sheldon will do anything everything to save her to save her oh my god has it come to that he grew a little calmer presently under diana's influence and went slowly back to the house he avoided the open window by which charlotte was sitting he had not yet schooled himself to meet her questioning looks he went to the room where they were to dine a duller and darker apartment than the parlour and here he found mr sheldon reading a paper one of the eternal records of the eternal money market the stockbroker had been in and out of the house all day now sauntering by the seashore now leaning moodily with folded arms on the garden gate meditative and silent as the cow that stared at charlotte now pacing the garden walks with his hands in his pockets and his head bent diana who in her anxiety kept a close watch upon mr sheldon's movements had noted his restlessness and perceived in it the sign of growing anxiety on his part she knew that he had once called himself surgeon dentist and had some medical knowledge if not so much as he took credit for possessing he must therefore be better able to judge the state of charlotte's health than utterly ignorant observers if he were uneasy there must be real cause for uneasiness it was on this account and on this account only that diana watched him he must love her better than i gave him credit for being able to love any one miss paget said to herself dear girl the coldest heart is touched by her sweetness mr sheldon looked up from his newspaper as valentine came into the room and saluted the visitor with a friendly nod glad to see you hawkehurst he said semper fidelis and that kind of thing the very model of devoted lovers why man alive how glum you look i think i have reason to look glum answered valentine gravely i have seen charlotte yes and don't you find her improving gradually of course that constitutional languor is not shaken off in a hurry but surely you think her improving brightening brightening with the light that never shone on earth or sea god help me i i i am the merest child the veriest coward the he made a great effort and stifled the sob that had well nigh broken his voice mr sheldon he continued quietly i believe your stepdaughter is dying dying good heavens my dear hawkehurst this alarm is most most premature there is no cause for fear 
at present no cause i give you my word as a medical man no cause for alarm at present that means my darling will not be taken from me to-night or to-morrow i shall have a few days breathing time yes i understand the doom is upon us i saw the shadow of death upon her face to-day my dear hawkehurst my dear sheldon for pity's sake don't treat me as if i were a woman or a child let me know my fate if if this the worst most bitter of all calamities god's hand raised against me in punishment of past sins sinned lightly and recklessly in the days when my heart had no stake in the game of destiny can inflict upon me if this deadly sorrow is bearing down upon me let me meet it like a man let me die with my eyes uncovered oh my dearest my fondest redeeming angel of my ill-spent life have you been only a supernal visitant after all shining on me for a little while to depart when your mission of redemption is accomplished powers above thought mr sheldon what nonsense these sentimental magazine writers can talk he was in no wise melted by the lover's anguish though it was very real such a grief as this was outside the circle in which his thoughts revolved this display of grief was unpleasant to him it grated painfully upon his nerves as some of poor tom halliday's little speeches had done of old when the honest-hearted yorkshireman lay on his deathbed and the young man's presence and the young man's anxiety were alike inconvenient tell me the truth mr sheldon valentine said presently with suppressed intensity is there any hope for my darling any hope mr sheldon considered for some moments before he replied to this question he pursed up his lips and bent his brows with the same air of business-like deliberation that he might have assumed while weighing the relative merits of the first and second debenture bonds of some doubtful railway company you ask me a trying question hawkehurst he said at last if you ask me plainly whether i like the turn which charlotte's illness has taken within the last few weeks i must tell you frankly i do not there is a persistent want of tone a visible decay of vital power which i must confess has caused me some uneasiness you see the fact is there is a radical weakness of constitution as miss paget a very sensible girl and acute observer herself has remarked indeed a hereditary weakness and against this medicine is sometimes unavailing you need apprehend no neglect on my part hawkehurst all that can possibly be done is being done dr doddleson's instructions are carefully obeyed and is this dr doddleson competent to grapple with the case asked valentine i never heard of him as a great man that fact proves how little you know of the medical profession i know nothing of it i have had no need for doctors in my life and you think this dr doddleson really clever his position is a sufficient answer to that question will you let me telegraph for him this afternoon immediately you cannot telegraph from this place no but from st leonard's i can do you think i am afraid of a five-mile walk but why send for dr doddleson the treatment he prescribed is the treatment we are now following to the letter to summon him down here would be the merest folly our poor charlotte's illness is so far free from all alarming symptoms you do not see the change in her that i can see cried valentine piteously for mercy's sake mr sheldon let me have my way in this i cannot stand by and see my dear one fading and do nothing nothing to save her let me send for this man let me see him myself and hear what he says you can have no objection to his coming since he is the man you have chosen for charlotte's adviser it can only be a question of expense let this particular visit be my affair i can afford to pay for my stepdaughter's medical attendance without any help from your purse mr hawkehurst said the stockbroker with offended pride there is one element in the case which you appear to ignore what is that the alarm which this summoning of a doctor from london must cause in charlotte's mind 
it need cause no alarm she can be told that dr doddleson has come to this part of the world for a sunday's change of air the visit can appear to be made en passant it will be easy to arrange that with the doctor before he sees her as you please mr hawkehurst the stockbroker replied coldly i consider such a visit to the last degree unnecessary but if dr doddleson's coming can give you any satisfaction by all means let him come the expense involved in summoning him is of the smallest consideration to me my position with regard to my wife's daughter is one of extreme responsibility and i am ready to perform all the obligations of that position you are very good your conduct in relation to charlotte and myself has been beyond all praise it is quite possible that i am over anxious but there was a look in that dear face no i cannot forget that look it struck terror to my heart i will go at once to st leonard's i can tell charlotte that i am obliged to telegraph to the printer about my copy you will not object to that white lie not at all i think it essential that charlotte should not be alarmed you had better stop to dine there will be time for the telegram after dinner i will not risk that answered valentine i cannot eat or drink till i have done something to lessen this wretched anxiety he went back to the room where charlotte was sitting by the open window through which there came the murmur of waves the humming of drowsy bees the singing of birds all the happy voices of happy nature in a harmonious chorus o oh god wilt thou take her away from such a beautiful world he asked and change all the glory of earth to darkness and desolation for me his heart rebelled against the idea of her death to save her to win her back to himself from the jaws of death he was ready to promise anything to do anything all my days will i give to thy service if thou wilt spare her to me in his heart he said to his god if thou dost not i will be an infidel and a pagan the vilest and most audacious of sinners better to serve lucifer than the god who could so afflict me and this is where the semi-enlightened christian betrays the weakness of his faith while the sun shines and the sweet gospel story reads to him like some tender arcadian idol all love and promise he is firm in his allegiance but when the dark hour comes he turns his face to the wall with anger and disappointment in his heart and will have no further commune with the god who has chastised him his faith is the faith of the grateful leper who being healed was eager to return and bless his divine benefactor it is not the faith of abraham or of job of paul or of stephen valentine told his story about the printers and the copy for the cheapside magazine about which there had arisen some absurd mistake only to be set right by a telegram it was not a very clear account but charlotte did not perceive the vagueness of the story she thought only of the one fact that valentine must leave her for some hours the evening will seem so long without you she said that is the worst part of my illness the time is so long so weary diana is the dearest and kindest of friends she is always trying to amuse me and reads to me for hours though i know she must often be tired of reading aloud so long but even the books i was once so fond of do not amuse me the words seem to float indistinctly in my brain and all sorts of strange images mix themselves up with the images of the people in the book Di has been reading the bride of lammermoor all this morning but the pain and weariness i feel seem to be entangled with lucy and edgar somehow and the dear book gave me no pleasure my darling you you are too weak to listen to diana's reading it is very kind of her to try to amuse you but but it would be better for you to rest altogether any kind of mental exertion may help to retard your recovery he had placed himself behind her chair and was bending over the pillows to speak to her just now he felt himself unequal to the command of his countenance he bent his head until his lips touched the soft brown hair and kissed those loose soft tresses passionately the thought occurred to him that a day might come 
when he should again kiss that soft brown hair with a deeper passion with a sharper pain and when charlotte would not know of his kisses or pity his pain oh valentine cried charlotte you are crying i can see your face in the glass he had forgotten the glass the little rococo mirror with an eagle hovering over the top of the frame which hung above the old-fashioned chiffonier i am not so very ill dear i am not indeed the girl continued turning in her chair with an effort and clasping her lover's hands you must not distress yourself like this valentine dear valentine i shall be better by and by i cannot think that i shall be taken from you he had broken down altogether by this time he buried his face in the pillows and contrived to stifle the sobs that would come and then after a sharp struggle he lifted his face and bent over the chair once more to kiss the invalid's pale upturned forehead my dear one you shall not if love can guard and keep you no dear i cannot believe that god will take you from me heaven may be your fittest habitation but such sweet spirits as yours are sorely needed upon earth i will be brave dearest one brave and hopeful in the mercy of heaven and now i must go and telegraph to my tiresome printer au revoir he hurried away from the farmhouse and started at a rattling pace along the pleasant road with green waving corn on his left and broad blue ocean on his right i can get a fly to bring me back from st leonard's he thought i should only lose time by hunting for a vehicle here he was at st leonard's station within an hour after leaving the farm he dispatched the message in mr sheldon's name and took care to make it urgent End of chapter five at harold's hill book the seventh chapter six of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by celine major charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braden chapter six desperate measures fitful and feverish were the slumbers which visited mr hawkehurst on that balmy summer's night his waking hours were anxious and unhappy but his sleeping hours were still more painful to sleep was to be the feverish fool of vague wild visions in which charlotte and dr doddleson the editor of the cheapside the officials of the british museum reading-room diana paget and the sheldons figured amidst inextricable confusion of circumstances and places throughout these wretched dreams he had some consciousness of himself and the room in which he was lying the july moon shining upon him broad and bright through the diamond-paned lattice and oh what torturing visions were those in which charlotte smiled upon him radiant with health and happiness and there had been no such thing as her illness no such thing as his grief and then came hurried dreams in which dr doddleson was knocking at the farmhouse door with the printer of the cheapside and then he was a spectator in a mighty theatre large as those roman amphitheatres wherein the audience seemed a mass of flies looking down on the encounter of two other flies in all the glory of an imperial court only a little spot of purple and gold gleaming afar in the sunshine to the dreamer it was no surprise that this unknown theatre of his dreams should be vast as a gladiatorial arena and then came the deep thunderous music of innumerable bass viols and bassoons and some one told him it was the first night of a great tragedy he felt the breathless hush of expectation the solemn bass music sank deeper dark curtains were drawn aside with a motion slow and solemn like the waving of mountain pines and there appeared a measureless stage revealing a moonlit expanse thickly studded with the white headstones of unnumbered graves and on the foremost of these revealed to him by what power he knew not since mortal sight could never have reached a point so distant he read the name of charlotte halliday he awoke with a sharp cry of pain it was broad day and the waves were dancing gaily in the morning sunlight he rose and dressed himself 
sleep such as he had known that night was worse than the weariest waking he went out into the garden by and by and paced slowly up and down the narrow pathways beside which box of a century's growth rose dark and high pale yellow lights were in the upper windows he wondered which of those sickly tapers flickered on the face he loved so fondly it is only a year since i first saw her he thought one year and to love her has been my liberal education to lose her would be my desolation and despair to lose her his thoughts approached that dread possibility but could not realize it not even yet at eight o'clock diana came to summon him to breakfast shall i see charlotte he asked no for some time past she has not come down to breakfast what kind of night has she had a very quiet night she tells me but i am not quite sure that she tells me the truth she is so afraid of giving us uneasiness she tells you but do you not sleep in her room now that she is so ill no i was anxious to sleep on a sofa at the foot of her bed and proposed doing so but mr sheldon objects to my being in the room he thinks that charlotte is more quiet entirely alone and that there is more air in the room with only one sleeper her illness is not of a kind to require attention of any sort in the night still i should have thought it better for her to have you with her to cheer and comfort her believe me valentine i wish to be with her i am sure of that dear he answered kindly it was only mr sheldon's authority as a man of some medical experience that conquered my wish well i suppose he is right and now we must go in to breakfast ah the dreary regularity of these breakfasts and dinners which go on just the same when our hearts are breaking the breakfast was indeed a dreary soul dispiriting meal farmhouse luxuries in the way of new-laid eggs and home-cured bacon abounded but no one had any inclination for these things valentine remembered the homestead among the yorkshire hills with all the delight that he had known there and the sorrow's crown of sorrow was very bitter mr sheldon gave his sabbath morning meditations to the study of a saturday evening share list and georgie plunged ever and anon into the closely printed pages of a dissenting preacher's biography which she declared to be comforting diana and valentine sat silent and anxious and after the faintest pretence of eating and drinking they both left the table to stroll drearily in the garden the bells were ringing cheerily from the grey stone tower near at hand but valentine had no inclination for church on this particular morning were not all his thoughts prayers humble piteous entreaties for one priceless boon will you see the doctor when he comes and manage matters so as not to alarm charlotte he asked of mr sheldon that gentleman agreed to do so and went out into the little front garden to lie in wait for the great doddleson dowager doddleson as he was surnamed by some irreverent unbelievers a st leonard's fly brought the doctor while the bells were still ringing for morning service mr sheldon received him at the gate and explained the motive of his summons the doctor was full of pompous solicitude about our sweet young patient really one of the most interesting cases i ever had upon my hands the west end physician said blandly as i was remarking to a very charming patient of mine in point of fact the amiable and accomplished countess of cassel Comberter, only last tuesday morning a case so nearly resembling the countess's own condition as to be highly interesting to her i really ought to apologize for bringing you down said mr sheldon as he led the doctor into the house i only consented to your being sent for in order to tranquillize this young fellow hawkehurst who is engaged to my daughter a rising man i believe in his own particular line but rather wild and impracticable there is really no change for the worse none and as we have not been here more than three days there has been positively no opportunity for testing the effect of change in sea air and so on this seemed rather like giving the learned physician his cue and there were those among dr doddleson's professional rivals who said that the worthy doctor was never slow to take a cue so given not being prejudiced by any opinions of his own charlotte had by this time been established in her easy-chair by the open window of the sitting-room 
and here dr doddleson saw her in the presence of mr and mrs sheldon and here dr doddleson went through the usual abracadabra of his art and assented to the opinions advanced with all deference by mr sheldon to georgie this interview in which mr sheldon's opinions were pompously echoed by the west end physician proved even more comforting than the benignant career of the dissenting minister who was wont to allude to that solemn passing hence of which the ancients spoke in dim suggestive phrase as going upstairs diana and valentine strolled in the garden while the physician saw his patient dr doddleson's ponderous polysyllables floated out upon the summer air like the droning of a humble-bee it was a relief to valentine to know that the doctor was with his patient but he had no intention to let that gentleman depart unquestioned i will take no second-hand information he thought i will hear this man's opinion from his own lips he went around to the front of the house directly the droning had ceased and was in the way when dr doddleson and mr sheldon came out of the rose-hung porch if you have no objection he said to mr sheldon i should like to ask dr doddleson a few questions i have no objection replied the stockbroker but it is really altogether such an unusual thing and i doubt if dr doddleson will consent to and here he cast a deprecating glance at the doctor as who should say can you permit yourself to comply with a demand so entirely unwarranted by precedent dowager doddleson was eminently good-natured and this is our sweet young friend's fiance he said dear me dear me and then he looked at valentine with bland pale blue eyes that twinkled behind his gold-framed spectacles while valentine was taking his measure so far as the measure of any man's moral and intellectual force can be taken by the eyes of another man and this is the man who is chosen to snatch my darling from the jaws of death he said to himself with burning rage in his heart while the amiable physician repeated blandly and this is our sweet young patient's fiance dear me how very interesting the three men strolled round to the garden behind the house mr sheldon close at the physician's elbow for god's sake tell me the truth dr doddleson said valentine in a low hoarse voice directly they were beyond earshot of the house i am a man and i can steel myself to hear the worst you can tell but really Ockhurst, there is no occasion for this kind of thing interjected philip sheldon dr doddleson agrees with me that the case is one of extreme languor and no more unquestionably said the doctor in a fat voice and dr doddleson also coincides with me in the opinion that all we can do is to wait the reviving influence of sea air undoubtedly said the doctor with a solemn nod and is this all asked valentine hopelessly my dear sir what else can i say said the doctor as my good friend mr sheldon has just remarked there is extreme languor and as my good friend mr sheldon further observes we must await the effect of change of air the uh invigorating sea breezes the uh enlivening influence of new surroundings and uh so forth dr poseidon my dear sir is a very valuable coadjutor and you think your patient no worse dr doddleson the doctor has just left mrs sheldon much comforted by his assurance that her daughter is better said the stockbroker no no exclaimed dr doddleson no no there my good friend mr sheldon somewhat misrepresents me i said that our patient was not obviously worse i did not say that our patient was better there is a dilatation of the pupil of the eye which i don't quite understand mental excitement said mr sheldon somewhat hastily charlotte is nervous to an extreme degree and your sudden arrival was calculated to shake her nerves undoubtedly rejoined the doctor and it is unquestionable that such a dilation of the pupil might under certain circumstances be occasioned by mental excitement i am sorry to find that our patient's attacks of dizziness which are purely the effect of fancy interjected mr sheldon which are no doubt in some measure attributable to a hypochondriacal condition of mind continued the doctor in his fat voice i am sorry to find that this periodical dizziness has been somewhat increased of late but here again 
we must look to dr poseidon tepid sea baths if they can be managed in the patient's own room and by and by a dip in the waves yonder may do wonders valentine asked no further questions and the physician departed in the st leonard's fly to turn his excursion to profitable use by calling on two or three dowagers in warrior square and marina who would doubtless be glad of an unexpected visit from their pet doctor well hawkehurst said mr sheldon when the fly had driven away i hope you are satisfied now satisfied cried valentine yes i am satisfied that your stepdaughter is being murdered murdered echoed the stockbroker his voice thick and faint but valentine did not heed the change in it yes murdered sacrificed to the utter incompetence of that old idiot who has just left us philip sheldon drew a long breath what he exclaimed do you doubt doddleson's skill do you believe in it do you no i cannot think that a man of your keen perception in all other matters half a medical man yourself can be the dupe of so shallow an impostor and it is to that man's judgment my darling's life has been confided and it is to that man i have looked with hope and comfort in the thought of his power to save my treasure good god what a reed on which to rely and of all the medical men of london this is the one you have chosen i must really protest against this rant hawkehurst said philip sheldon i hold myself responsible for the selection which i made and will not have that selection questioned in this violent and outrageous manner by you your anxiety for charlotte's recovery may excuse a great deal but it cannot excuse this kind of thing and if you cannot command yourself better i must beg you to absent yourself from my house until my stepdaughter's recovery puts an end to all this fuss do you believe in dr doddleson's skill asked valentine doggedly he wanted to have that question answered at any cost most decidedly i do with the rest of the medical world my choice of this gentleman as charlotte's adviser was governed by his reputation as a safe and conscientious man his opinions are sound trustworthy his opinions cried valentine with a bitter laugh what in heaven's name do you call his opinions the only opinions i could extract from him to-day were solemn echoes of yours and the man himself i took the measure of him before i asked him a question and physiology is a lie if that man is anything better than an impostor his position is the answer to that his position is no answer he is not the first impostor who has attained position and is not likely to be the last you must forgive me if i speak with some violence mr sheldon i feel too deeply to remember the conventionalities of my position the dear girl yonder hovering between life and death is my promised wife as your stepdaughter she is very dear to you no doubt and you are of course anxious to do your duty as her stepfather but she is all the world to me my one sweet memory of the past my sole hope for the future i will not trust her to the care of dr doddleson i claim the right to choose another physician as that man's coadjutor if you please i have no wish to offend the doctor of your choice this is all sheer nonsense said mr sheldon it is nonsense about which you must let me have my own way replied valentine resolutely my stake on this hazard is too heavy for careless play i shall go back to town at once and seek out a physician do you know any great man no but i will find one if you go to-day you will inevitably alarm charlotte true and disappoint her into the bargain i suppose in such a case to-morrow will do as well as to-day decidedly i can go by the first train and return with my doctor in the afternoon yes i will go to-morrow mr sheldon breathed more freely there are cases in which to obtain time for thought seems the one essential thing cases in which a reprieve is as good as a pardon pray let us consider this business quietly he said with a faint sigh of weariness there is no necessity for all this excitement you can go to town to-morrow by the first train as you say if it is any satisfaction to you to bring down a physician bring one bring half a dozen if you please but for the last time i most emphatically assure you that anything that tends to alarm charlotte 
is the one thing of all others most sure to hinder her recovery i know that she shall not be frightened but she shall have a better adviser than dr donaldson and now i will go back to the house she will wonder at my absence he went to the bright airy room where charlotte was seated her head lying back upon the pillows her face paler her glances and tones more languid than on the previous days it seemed to valentine diana was near her solicitous and tender and on the other side of the window sat mrs sheldon with her dissenting minister's biography open on her lap all through that day valentine hawkehurst played his part bravely it was a hard and bitter part to play the part of hope and confidence while unutterable fears were rending his heart he read the epistle and gospel of the day to his betrothed and afterwards some chapters of st john those profoundly mournful chapters that foreshadow the agonizing close it was charlotte who selected these chapters and her lover could find no excuse for disputing her choice it was the first time that they had shared any religious exercise and the hearts of both were deeply touched by the thought of this how frivolous all our talk must have been valentine when it seems so new to us to be reading these beautiful words together her head was half supported by the pillows half resting on her lover's shoulder and her eyes travelled along the lines as he read in a calm low voice which was unbroken to the end early in the evening charlotte retired worn out by the day's physical weariness in spite of valentine's fond companionship later when it was dusk diana came downstairs with the news that the invalid was sleeping quietly mrs sheldon was dozing in her armchair the dissenting minister having fallen to the ground and valentine was leaning with folded arms on the broad window-sill looking out into the shadowy garden mr sheldon had given them very little of his society during that day he went out immediately after his interview with valentine on a sea-coast ramble which lasted till dinner-time after dinner he remained in the room where they had dined he was there now the light of the candles by which he read his papers shone out upon the dusk will you come for a stroll with me diana asked valentine miss paget assented promptly and they went out into the garden beyond the reach of mr sheldon's ears had that gentleman been disposed to place himself at his open window in the character of a listener i want to tell you my plans about charlotte valentine began i am going to london to-morrow to search for a greater physician than dr doddleson i shall find my man in an hour or so and if possible shall return with him in the evening there is no apparent reason to anticipate any sudden change for the worse but if such a change should take place i rely on you dear to give me the earliest tidings of it i suppose you can get a fly here if you want one i can get to st leonard's if that is what you mean miss paget answered promptly i dare say there is a fly to be had if not i can walk there i am not afraid of a few miles walk by day or night if there should be a change valentine which god forbid i will telegraph the tidings of it to you you had better address the message to me at rancy's covent garden the house where the ragmuffins have their rooms you know dear that is a more central point than my lodgings and nearer the terminus i will call there two or three times in the course of the day you may trust my vigilance valentine i did not think it was in my nature to love any one as i love charlotte halliday gustave lenoble's letters lying unanswered in her desk asserted the all-absorbing nature of diana's affection for the fading girl she was fading the consciousness of this made all other love sacrilege as it seemed to diana she sat up late that night to answer gustave's last letter of piteous complaint she had forgotten him ah that he had been foolish insensate to confide himself in her love was he not old and grey in comparison to such youth such freshness a venerable dotard of thirty-five what had he with dreams of love and marriage fie then he humiliated himself in the dust beneath her menial feet he invited her to crush him with those cruel feet but if she did not answer his letters he would come to harold's hill he would mock himself of that ferocious sheldon of a battalion of sheldon still more ferocious of all the world at last to be near her believe me dear gustave i do not forget wrote diana in reply to these serio-comic remonstrances 
i was truly sorry to leave town on your account and on my father's but my dear adopted sister is paramount with me now you will not grudge her my care or my love for she may not long be with me to claim them there is nothing but sorrow here in all our hearts sorrow and ever present dread End of chapter six read by celine major book the eighth chapter one of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by celine major charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braden chapter i a dread revelation the early fast train by which valentine hawkehurst travelled brought him into town at a quarter past nine o'clock during the journey he had been meditating on the way in which he should set to work when he arrived in london no ignorance could be more profound than his on all points relating to the medical profession dimly floating in his brain there were the names of doctors whom he had heard of as celebrated men one for the chest another for the liver another for the skin another for the eyes but among all these famous men who was the man best able to cope with the mysterious wasting away the gradual almost imperceptible ebbing of that one dear life which valentine wanted to save this question must be answered by some one and valentine was sorely puzzled as to who that some one must be the struggling young writer had but few friends he had indeed worked too hard for the possibility of friendship the cultivation of the severer muses is rarely compatible with a wide circle of acquaintances and valentine if not a cultivator of these severe ones had been a hard and honest worker during the later reputable portion of his life his friendships of the previous portion had been the friendships of the railway carriage and the smoking-room the cafe and the gaming-table he could count upon his fingers the people to whom he could apply for counsel in this crisis of his life there was george sheldon a man for whom he entertained a most profound contempt captain paget a man who might or might not be able to give him good advice but who would inevitably sacrifice charlotte holliday's welfare to self-interest if self-interest could be served by the recommendation of an incompetent adviser he would send me to some idiot of the doddleson class if he thought he could get a guinea or a dinner by the recommendation valentine said to himself and decided that to horatio paget he would not apply there were his employers the editors and proprietors of the magazines for which he worked all busy overburdened workers in the great mill spending the sunny hours of their lives between a pile of unanswered letters and a waste-paper basket men who would tell him to look in the post-office directory without lifting their eyes from the paper over which their restless pens were speeding no amongst these was not the counsellor whom valentine hawkehurst needed in this dire hour of difficulty there are some very good fellows among the ragamuffins he said to himself as he thought of the only literary and artistic club of which he was a member fellows who stuck by me when i was down in the world and who would do anything to serve me now they know me for an honest worker but unfortunately farce writers and burlesque writers and young meersham smoking painters are not the sort of men to give good advice i want the advice of a medical man mr hawkehurst almost bounded from his seat as he said this the advice of a medical man yes and was there not a medical man among the ragamuffins and something more than a medical man that very doctor who of all other men upon this earth could give him best counsel a doctor who had stood by the deathbed of charlotte halliday's father he remembered the conversation that had occurred at bayswater on the evening of christmas day upon this very subject he remembered how from the talk about ghosts they had drifted somehow into talking of tom halliday whereupon mrs sheldon had been melted to tears and had gone on to praise philip sheldon's conduct to his dying friend and to speak of mr burkham the strange doctor called in too late to save or it might have been incapable to save sheldon seems to have a genius for calling in incapable doctors he thought bitterly incapable as mr burkham might have been for the exigencies of this particular case he would at least be able to inform valentine who among the medical celebrities of london would be best adapted to advise in such an illness as charlotte halliday's and if 
as diana has sometimes suggested there is any hereditary disease this berkham may be able to throw some light upon the nature of it thought valentine he went straight from the railway terminus to the quiet tavern upon the first floor of which the ragamuffins had their place of rendezvous it was not an hour for the encounter of many ragamuffins a meek-looking young man of clerical aspect who had adapted a palais royal farce and had awoke in the morning to find himself famous and eligible for admission amongst the ragamuffins was sipping his sherry and soda-water while he skimmed the morning papers him mr hawkehurst saluted with an absent nod and went in search of the steward of the club from whom he obtained mr berkham's address with some little trouble in the way of hunting through old and obscure documents it was the old address the old dingy comfortable muffin-bell haunted street in which mr berkham had lived ten years before when he was summoned to attend the sick yorkshire farmer mr berkham's career had not been brightened by the sunshine of prosperity he had managed to live somehow and to find food and raiment for his young wife who when she considered the lilies of the field may have envied their shining robes of pure whiteness so dingy and dark was her own apparel when children came the young surgeon contrived to find food and raiment for them also but not without daily and hourly struggles with that grim wolf who haunts the thresholds of so many dwellings it will not be thrust from the door sometimes a little glimmering ray of light illumined mr berkham's pathway and he was humbly grateful to providence for the brief glimpse of sunshine but for a meek fair-faced man with a nervous desire to do well a very poor opinion of his own merits and a diffident not to say depressed manner the world is apt to be a hard battleground mr berkham sometimes found himself well-nigh beaten in the cruel strife and at such times in the dead silence of the night with mortal agonies and writhings as of pythoness upon tripod mr berkham gave himself up to the composition of a farce adapted not from the french but from his memories of wright and bedford in the jovial old student days when the pit of the adelphi theatre had been the pleasant resort of his evenings he could no longer afford the luxury of theatrical entertainments except when provided with a free admission but from the hazy reminiscences floating in his poor tired brain he concocted little pieces which he fondly hoped might win him money and fame with much effort and interest he contrived to get himself elected a ragamuffin believing that to be a ragamuffin was to secure a position as a dramatic writer but with one or two fortunate exceptions his pieces were refused the managers would not have the poor little feeble phantasmagoria of bygone fun even supported by the whole clan of ragamuffins so mr berkham had gradually melted into the dimness of bloomsbury and haunted the club-room of the ragamuffins no more a hansom carried valentine hawkehurst swiftly to these regions of bloomsbury it was no time for the saving of cab hire the soldier of fortune thought no longer of his nest eggs his unitas bank deposit notes he was fighting with time and with death foes dire and dreadful against whose encroachments the sturdiest of mortal warriors can make but a feeble stand he found the dingy-looking house in the dingy-looking street and the humble drudge who opened the door informed him that mr berkham was at home and ushered him into a darksome and dreary surgery at the back of the house where a phrenological head considerably the worse for london smoke surmounted a dingy bookcase filled with the dingiest of books a table upon which were a blotting-book and inkstand and two shabby horsehair chairs composed the rest of the furniture valentine sent his card to the surgeon and seated himself on one of the horsehair chairs to await that gentleman's appearance he came after a brief delay which seemed long to his visitor he came from regions in the back of the house rubbing his hands which seemed to have been newly washed and the odour of senna and aloes hung about his garments i doubt if you remember my name mr berkham said valentine but you and i are members of the same club and that a club among the members of which considerable good feeling prevails i come to ask a favour mr berkham winced for this sounded like genteel begging and for genteel beggars this struggling surgeon had no spare cash which it will scarcely cause you a moment's thought to grant i am in great distress mr berkham winced again for this sounded still more like begging mental distress mr berkham gave a little sigh of relief and i come to you for advice mr berkham gave a more profound sigh of relief i can assure you that my best advice is at your command he said 
seating himself and motioning to his visitor to be seated i am beginning to remember your face amongst the members of the club though the name on your card did not strike me as familiar you see i have never been able to afford much time for relaxation at the ragamuffins though i assure you i found the agreeable conversation there the literary on d and so on very great relief but my own little efforts in the dramatic line were not successful and i found myself compelled to devote myself more to my profession and now i have said quite enough about myself let me hear how i can be useful to you in the first place let me ask you a question do you know anything of a certain dr doddleson of plantagenet square yes of plantagenet square well not much i have heard him called dowager doddleson and i believe he is very popular among hypochondriac old ladies who have more money than they know what to do with and very little common sense to regulate their disposal of it is dr doddleson a man to whom you would entrust the life of your dearest friend most emphatically no cried the surgeon growing red with excitement very well mr burkham my dearest friend a young lady well in plain truth the woman who was to have been my wife and whom i love as it is not the lot of every plighted wife to be loved this dear girl has been wasting away for the last two or three months under the influence of an inscrutable malady and dr doddleson is the only man called to attend her in all that time a mistake said mr burkham gravely a very great mistake dr doddleson lives in a fine square and drives a fine carriage and has a reputation amongst the class i have spoken of but he is about the last man i would consult as to the health of any one dear to me that is precisely the opinion which i formed after ten minutes conversation with him now what i want from you mr burkham is the name and address of the man to whom i can entrust this dear girl's life let me see there are so many men you know and great men is it a case of consumption no thank god heart disease perhaps no there is no organic disease it is a languor a wasting away mr burkham suggested other diseases whereof the outward sign was languor and wasting no replied valentine according to dr doddleson there is actually no disease nothing but this extreme prostration this gradual vanishing of vital power and now i come to another point upon which i want your advice it has been suggested that this constitutional weakness may be inherited and here i think you can help me how so you attended the lady's father indeed cried mr burkham delighted this is really interesting in what year did i attend this gentleman if you will allow me i will refer to some of my old case books he drew out a clumsy drawer in the clumsy table in order to hunt for old memoranda i am not quite certain as to the year answered valentine but it was more than ten years ago the gentleman died close by here in fitzgeorge street his name was halliday mr burkham had drawn out the drawer to its farthest extent as valentine pronounced this name he let it drop to the ground with a crash and sat statue-like staring at the speaker all other names given to mortal men he might forget but this one never valentine saw the sudden horror in his face before he could recompose his features into something of their conventional aspect yes he said looking down at the fallen drawer with its scattered papers and case-books yes i have some recollection of the name of halliday some very strange and agitating recollection it would seem by your manner mr burkham said valentine at once assured that there was something more than common in the surgeon's look and gesture and determined to fathom the mystery let it be what it might oh dear no said the surgeon nervously i was not agitated only surprised it was surprising to me to hear the name of a patient so long forgotten and so the lady to whom you are engaged is a daughter of mr halliday's the wife mrs halliday is still living i suppose yes but the lady who was then mrs halliday is now mrs sheldon of course he married her said mr burkham yes i remember hearing of the marriage he had tried in vain to recover his old composure he was white to the lips 
and his hands shook as he tried to arrange his scattered papers what does it mean thought valentine mrs sheldon talked of this man's inexperience can it be that his incompetency lost the life of his patient and that he knows it was so mrs halliday is now mrs sheldon repeated the surgeon in a feeble manner yes i remember and mr sheldon the dentist who at that time resided in fitzgeorge street is he still living he is still living it was he who called in dr doddleson to attend upon miss halliday as her stepfather he has some amount of authority you see not legal authority for my dear girl is of age but social authority he called in doddleson and appears to place confidence in him and he is something of a medical man himself and pretends to understand miss halliday's case thoroughly stop cried mr burkham suddenly abandoning all pretence of calmness has he sheldon any interest in his stepdaughter's death no certainly not all her father's money went to him upon his marriage with her mother he can gain nothing by her death on the contrary he may lose a good deal for she is the heir at law to a large fortune and if she dies that fortune will go i really don't know where it will go valentine answered carelessly he thought the subject was altogether beside the question of mr burkham's agitation and it was the cause of that agitation which he was anxious to discover if mr sheldon can gain by his stepdaughter's death fear him exclaimed the surgeon with sudden passion fear him as you would fear death itself worse than death for death is neither so stealthy nor so treacherous as he is what in heaven's name do you mean that which i thought my lips would never utter to mortal hearing that which i dare not publicly proclaim at the hazard of taking the bread out of the mouths of my wife and children i have kept this hateful secret for eleven years through many a sleepless night and dreary day i will tell it to you for if there is another life in peril that life shall be lost through no cowardice of mine what secret cried valentine the secret of that poor fellow's death my god i can remember the clasp of his hand and the friendly look of his eyes the day before he died he was poisoned by philip sheldon you must be mad gasped valentine in a faint voice for one moment of astonishment and incredulity he thought this man must needs be a fool or a lunatic so wildly improbable did the accusation seem but in the next instant the curtain was lifted and he knew that philip sheldon was a villain and knew that he had never wholly trusted him never until to-day have i told this secret said the surgeon not even to my wife i thank you answered valentine in the same faint voice with all my heart i thank you yes the curtain was lifted this mysterious illness this slow silent decay of bloom and beauty by a process inscrutable as the devilry of medieval poisoner or hecate serving witch this was murder murder the disease which had hitherto been nameless had found its name at last it was all clear now philip sheldon's anxiety the selection of an utterly incompetent adviser certain looks and tones that had for a moment mystified him and had been forgotten in the next came back to him with a strange distinctness with all their hidden meaning made clear and plain as the broad light of day but the motive what motive could prompt the slow destruction of that innocent life a fortune was at stake it is true but that fortune as valentine understood the business depended on the life of charlotte halliday beyond this point he had never looked in all his consideration of the circumstances relating to the higarthian estate he had never thought of what might happen in the event of charlotte's decease it is a diabolical mystery he said to himself there can be no motive none to destroy thomas holliday was to clear his way to fortune to destroy charlotte is to destroy his chance of fortune and then he remembered the dark speeches of george sheldon my god and this is what he meant as plainly as he dared tell me he did tell me that his brother was an utterable scoundrel and i turned a deaf ear to his warning because it suited my own interest to believe that villain for her dear sake i believed him 
i would have believed in beelzebub if he had promised me her dear hand and i let myself be duped by the lying promise and left my darling in the power of beelzebub thoughts followed each other swift as lightning through his overwrought brain it seemed but a moment that he had been sitting with his clenched hands pressed against his forehead when he turned suddenly upon the surgeon for god's sake help me guide me he said you have struck a blow that has numbed my senses what am i to do my future wife is in that man's keeping dying as i believe how am i to save her i cannot tell you you may take the cleverest man in london to see her but it is a question if that man will perceive the danger so clearly as to take prompt measures in these cases there is always room for doubt and a man would rather doubt his own perceptions than believe the hellish truth it is by this natural hesitation so many lives are lost while the doctor deliberates the patient dies and then if the secret of the death transpires by circumstantial evidence perhaps which never came to the doctor's knowledge there is a public outcry the doctor's practice is ruined and his heart broken the outcry would have still been louder if he had told the truth in time to save the patient and had not yet been able to prove his words you think me a coward and a scoundrel because i dared not utter my suspicion when i saw mr halliday dying while it was only a suspicion it would have been certain ruin for me to give utterance to it the day came when it was almost a conviction i went back to that man sheldon's house determined to insist upon the calling in of a physician who would have made that conviction certainty my resolution came too late it is possible that sheldon had perceived my suspicions and had hastened matters my patient was dead before i reached the house how am i to save her repeated valentine with the same helpless manner he could not bring himself to consider tom halliday's death the subject was too far away from him remote as the dim shadows of departed centuries in all the universe there were but two figures standing out in lurid brightness against the dense night of chaos a helpless girl held in the clutches of a secret assassin and it was his work to rescue her what am i to do he asked tell me what i am to do what it may be wisest to do i cannot tell you answered mr burkham almost as helplessly as the other had asked the question i can give you the name of the best man to get to the bottom of such a case a man who gave evidence on the friar trial jed you have heard of jed i dare say you had better go straight to jed and take him down with you to miss halliday his very name will frighten sheldon i will go at once stay the address where am i to find dr jed in burlington row but there is one thing to be considered what the interference of jed may only make that man desperate he may hasten matters now as he hastened matters before if you had seen his coolness at that time if you had seen him as i saw him standing by that poor fellow's deathbed, comforting him yes with friendly speeches laughing and joking watching the agonizing pain and the miserable sickness and all the dreary wretchedness of such a death and never swerving from his work if you had seen him you would understand why i am afraid to advise you that man was as desperate as he was cool when he murdered his friend he will be more reckless this time why because he has reached a higher stage in the science of murder the symptoms of that poor yorkshire man were the symptoms of arsenical poisoning the symptoms of which you have told me to-day denote a vegetable poison that affords very vague diagnosis and leaves no trace that was the agent which enabled the borgias to decimate rome it is older than classic greece and simple as a b c and will remain so until the medical expert is a recognized officer of the law the faithful guardian of the bed over which the suspected poisoner loiters past master of the science in which the murderer is rarely more than an experimentalist and protected from all the hazards of plain speaking by the nature of his office great heaven how am i to save her exclaimed valentine he could not contemplate the subject in its broad social aspect he could only think of this one dear life at stake to send this dr jed might be to hasten her death to send a less efficient man would be mere childishness 
what shall i do he looked despairingly at the surgeon and in that one glance perceived what a frail reed this was upon which he was leaning and then like the sudden gleam of lightning a name flashed across his mind george sheldon the lawyer the schemer the man who of all the world best knew this vile enemy and assassin against whom he was matched he it was of whom counsel should be asked in this crisis once perceiving this valentine was prompt to act it was the first flash of light in the darkness you mean to stand by me in this don't you he asked mr burkham with all my heart and soul good then you must go to dr jed instantly tell him all you know tom halliday's death the symptoms of charlotte's decline as you have heard them from me everything and let him hold himself in readiness to start for hastings directly he hears from or sees me i am going to a man who of all men can tell me how to deal with philip sheldon i shall try to be in burlington row in an hour from this time but in any case you will wait there till i come i suppose in a desperate case like this dr jedd will put aside all less urgent work no doubt of that i trust you to secure his sympathy said valentine he was in the darksome entrance hall by this time mr burkham followed and opened the door for him have no fear of me he said Goodbye. The two men shook hands with a grip significant as Masonic sign manual. It meant on the one party hearty cooperation, on the other implicit confidence. In the next moment, Valentine sprang into the cab. King's Road, entrance to Gray's Inn, and drive like mad, he shouted to the driver. The hansom rattled across the stones, dashed round corners, struck consternation to scudding children in pinafores, all but annihilated more than one perambulator and in less than ten minutes after leaving mr burkham's door ground against the curbstone before the little gate of gray's inn god grant that george sheldon may be at home valentine said to himself as he hurried towards that gentleman's office george sheldon was at home in this fight against time mr hawkehurst had so far found the odds in his favour bless my soul exclaimed the lawyer looking up from his desk as valentine appeared on the threshold of the door pale and breathless to what do i owe the unusual honour of a visit from mr hawkehurst i thought that rising literata had cut all old acquaintances and gone in for the upper circles i have come to you on a matter of life and death george sheldon said valentine this is no time to talk of why i haven't been to you before when you and i last met you advised me to beware of your brother philip it wasn't the first or the second or the third time that you so warned me and now speak out like an honest man and tell me what you meant by that warning for god's sake speak plainly this time i cannot afford to speak more plainly than i have spoken half a dozen times already i told you to beware of my brother phil and i meant that warning in its fullest significance if you had chosen to take my advice you would have placed charlotte halliday's fortune and charlotte halliday herself beyond his power by an immediate marriage you didn't choose to do that and there was an end of the matter i have been a heavy loser by your pig-headed obstinacy and i dare say before you and phil sheldon have done with each other you too will find yourself a loser god help me yes cried valentine with a groan i stand to make the heaviest loss that was ever made by man what do you mean exclaimed george shall i tell you what you meant when you warned me against your own brother shall i tell you why you so warned me you know that philip sheldon murdered tom halliday great god yes the secret is out you knew it how or when you discovered it i cannot tell you know of that one hellish crime and would have prevented the commission of a second murder you should have spoken more plainly to know what you knew and to confine yourself to cautious hints and vague suggestions as you did was to have part in that devilish work if charlotte halliday dies her blood be upon your head upon yours as well as upon his the young man had risen in his passion and stood before george sheldon with uplifted hands and eyes that flashed angry lightnings it seemed almost as if he would have called down the divine vengeance upon this man's head if charlotte halliday dies repeated george in horror-stricken whisper why should you suggest such a thing because she is dying there was a pause 
valentine flung himself passionately upon the chair from which he had just risen with his back to george sheldon and his face bent over the back of the chair the lawyer sat looking straight before him with a ghastly countenance i told him he meant this he said to himself in a hoarse whisper i told him in this office not six months ago powers of hell what a villain he is and there are people who do not believe there is a devil for a few moments valentine gave free vent to his passion of grief these tears of rage of agony the most supreme were the first he had shed since he had bent his face over charlotte's soft brown hair to hide the evidence of his sorrow when he had dashed these bitter drops away from his burning eyes he turned to confront george sheldon pale as death but very calm and after this he gave way no more to his passion he was matched against time of all enemies the most pitiless and unrelenting and every minute wasted was a point scored by his foe i want your help george sheldon he said if you have ever been sorry that you made no effort to save charlotte halliday's father prove yourself his friend by trying to save her if i have ever been sorry echoed the lawyer why my miserable dreams have never been free from the horror of that man's face you don't know what it is murder nobody knows who hasn't been concerned in it you read of murders in your newspapers a shot b or c poison d and so on all through the letters of the alphabet with a fresh batch for every sunday but it never comes home to you you think of the horror of it in a shadowy kind of way as you might think of having a snake twisted round your waist and legs like that blessed man and boys one never sees the last of but if you were to look at that plaster cast all your life you couldn't realize ten per cent of the horror you'd feel if the snake was there alive crushing your bones and hissing in your ear i have been face to face with murder valentine hawkehurst and if i were to live a century i should never forget what i felt when i stood by tom halliday's deathbed and it flashed upon me all at once that my brother phil was poisoning him and you did not try to save him your friend cried valentine why you see replied the other in a strange slow way it was too late to save him i knew that and i held my tongue what could i do against my own brother that sort of thing in a family is ruin for every one do you think anybody would have brought their business to me after my brother had stood in the old bailey dock to take his trial for murder no my only course was to keep my own counsel and i kept it phil made eighteen thousand pounds by his marriage with poor tom's widow and a paltry hundred or two is all i ever touched of that money and you could touch that money cried valentine aghast money carries no infection did you ever ask any questions about the money you won at german gaming tables i dare say some of your napoleons and ten taller notes could have told queer stories if they had been able to talk taking phil's money has never weighed upon my conscience i'm not very inquisitive about the antecedents of a five-pound note but i'll tell you what it is hawkehurst i'd give all i have and all i ever hoped to have and would go out and sweep a crossing to-morrow if i could get tom holliday's face out of my mind with the look that he turned upon me the last time i saw him ah george he said in illness a man feels the comfort of being among friends and he took my hand and squeezed it in his old hearty way we had been boys together hawkehurst birds nesting in highly woods on the same side in our barlingford cricket matches and i shook his hand and went away and left him to die and here mr sheldon of gray's inn the sheldon who was in with the money-lenders sharpest of legal prestidigitators most ruthless of opponents most unscrupulous of allies buried his face in a flaming bandana and fairly sobbed aloud when the passion had passed he got up and walked hastily to the window more ashamed of this one touch of honest emotion than of all the falsehoods and chicaneries of his career i didn't think i could have been such an ass he muttered sheepishly i did not hope that you could feel so deeply answered valentine and now help me to save the only child of your ill-fated friend i am sure that you can help me without waiting to be questioned valentine related the circumstances of charlotte's illness and of his interview with mr Burkham 
i did not even know that the poor girl was ill said george sheldon i have not seen phil for months he came here one day and i gave him a bit of my mind i told him if he tried to harm her i'd let the light in upon him and his doings and i'll keep my word but his motive what in the name of heaven can be his motive for taking her innocent life he knows of the haygarth estate and must hope to profit by her fortune if she lives yes and to secure the whole of that fortune if she dies her death would make her mother sole heir to that estate and the mother is the merest tool in his hands he may even have induced charlotte to make a will in his favour so that he himself may stand in her shoes she would not have made a will without telling me of it you don't know that my brother phil can do anything it would be as easy for him to persuade her to maintain secrecy about the transaction as to persuade her to make the will do you suppose he shrinks from multiplying lies and forgeries and hypocrisies do you suppose anything in that small way comes amiss to the man who has once brought his mind to murder why look at the scotch play of that fellow shakespeare's at the beginning your macbeth is a respectable trustworthy sort of person anxious to go on and that's all but no sooner has he made an end of poor old duncan than he lays about him right and left banco fleance anybody and everybody that happens to be in his way it was lucky for that tartar of a wife of his that she hooked it or he'd soon have put a stop to her sleepwalking there's no such wide difference between a man and a tiger after all the tiger's a decent fellow enough till he has tasted human blood but once he has lord save the countryside from the jaws of the man-eater for heaven's sake let us waste no time in talk valentine cried impetuously i am to meet burkham in burlington road directly i have got your advice what for to see dr jedd and take him down to hastings if possible that won't do why not because jedd's appearance would give phil the office jedd gave evidence on the friar trial and must be a marked man to him all jedd can tell you is that charlotte is being poisoned you know that already of course she'll want medical treatment and so on to bring her round but she can't get that under my brother's roof what you have to do is to get her away from that house you do not know how ill she is i doubt if she could bear the removal anything is better than to remain that is certain death but your brother would surely dispute her removal he would and oppose it inch by inch we must get him away before we attempt to remove her how i will find the means for that i know something of his business relations and can invent some false cry for luring him off the trail we must get him away the poor girl was not in actual danger when you left her was she no thank god there was no appearance of immediate danger but she was very ill and that man holds her life in his hand he knows that i have come to london in search of a doctor what if keep yourself quiet hawkehurst he will not hasten her death unless he is desperate for a death occurring immediately after your first expression of alarm would seem sudden he'll avoid any appearance of suddenness if he can depend upon it the first thing is to get him away but the question is how to do it there must be a bait what bait don't talk to me hawkehurst let me think it out if i can the lawyer leaned on his elbows on the table and abandoned himself to profound cogitation with his forehead supported by his clenched hands valentine waited patiently while he thus cogitated i must go to phil's office he said at last and ferret out some of his secrets nothing but stock exchange business of an important character would induce him to leave charlotte halliday but if i can telegraph such a message as will bring him to town i'll do it leave all that to me and now what about your work i am at a loss what to do if i am not to take dr jedd to harold's hill take him to st leonard's and if i get my brother out of the way you can have charlotte conveyed to an hotel in st leonard's where she can stop till she picks up strength enough to come to london do you think her mother will consent to her removal do i think you will be such an idiot as to ask for her consent cried george sheldon impatiently my brother's wife is so weak a fool that the chances are she'd insist on her daughter stopping quietly to be poisoned no you must get mrs sheldon out of the way somehow send her to look at the shops or to bathe or to pick up shells on the beach or anything else equally inane she's easy enough to deal with 
there's that young woman paget's daughter with them still i suppose yes very well then you and she can get sharded away between you but for me to take those two girls to an hotel the chance of scandal of wonder of inquiry there ought to be some other person some nurse stay there's nancy woolper the very woman my darling has told me of that old woman's affectionate anxiety about her health an anxiety which was singularly intense it seemed to lotta good god do you think she nancy woolper could have suspected the cause of mr halliday's death i dare say she did she was in the house when he died and nursed him all through his illness she's a clever old woman yes you might take her down with you i think she would be of use in getting charlotte away i'll take her if she will go i am not sure of that our north country folks have stiffish notions about fidelity to old masters and that kind of thing nancy woolper nursed my brother phil if she knows or suspects the fate of charlotte's father she will try to save charlotte said valentine with conviction and now good-bye i trust to you for getting your brother out of the way george sheldon remember that he held out his hand the lawyer took it with a muscular grip which on this occasion meant something more than that base coin of jolly good fellowship which so often passes current for friendship's virgin gold you may trust me george sheldon said gravely stop a moment though i have a proposition to make if my brother philip induced that girl to make a will as it is my belief he has we must counter him come down with me to doctor's commons you've a cab yes the business won't take half an hour what business a special license for your marriage with charlotte halliday a marriage yes her marriage invalidates her will if she has made one and does away with phil's motive come along we'll get the license but the delay exactly half an hour come the lawyer dashed out of his office at home in an hour he shouted to the clerk and then ran downstairs followed closely by valentine and did not cease running until he was in the king's road where the cab was waiting newgate street and warwick lane to doctors commons he cried to the cabman and valentine was fain to take his seat in the cab without further remonstrance i don't understand he began as the cabman drove away i do it's all right you'll put the license in your pocket and call at the church nearest which you hang out edgware roadway give notice of the marriage and so on and as soon as charlotte can bear the journey bring her to london and marry her i told you your course six months ago your obstinacy has caused the hazard of that young woman's life don't let us have a second edition of it i will be governed by your advice answered valentine submissively it is the delay that tortures me the delay was indeed torture to him everything and everybody in doctor's commons seemed the very incarnation of slowness the handsome cab might tear and grind the pavement the handsome cabman might swear until even monster wagons swerved aside to give him passage but neither tearing nor swearing could move the incarnate stolidity of doctor's commons when he left that quaint sanctuary of old usages he carried with him the archbishop of canterbury's benign permission for his union with charlotte halliday but he knew not whether it was only a morsel of waste paper which he carried in his pocket and whether there might not ere long be need of a ghastlier certificate giving leave and license for the rendering back of ashes to ashes and dust to dust valentine's first call after leaving george sheldon at the gate of doctor's commons was at the headquarters of the ragamuffins his heart sank as he ran into the bar of the hostelry to ask for the telegram which might be waiting for him happily there was no telegram to find no tidings of a change for the worse seemed to him almost equivalent to hearing of a change for the better what had he not feared after his interview with the surgeon of bloomsbury from covent garden the hansom bowled swiftly to burlington row here valentine found mr burkham pale and anxious waiting in a little den of a third room on the ground floor a ghastly little room hung with anatomical plates and with some wax preparations in jars on the mantelpiece by way of ornament to them presently came dr jedd as lively and businesslike as if miss halliday's case had been a question of taking out a double tooth very sad he said these vegetable poisons hands of unscrupulous man very interesting article in the medical quarterly speculative analysis of the science of toxicology as known to the ancients 
you will come down to harold's hill at once sir said valentine imploringly well yes your friend here mr burkham has persuaded me to do so though i need hardly tell you that such a journey will be to the last degree inconvenient it is an affair of life and death faltered the young man of course my dear sir but then you see i have half a dozen other affairs of life and death on my hands at this moment however i have promised my consultations will be over in half an hour i have a round of visits after that and by well say by the five o'clock express i will go to st leonard's the delay will be very long said valentine it cannot be done sooner i ought to go down to hertfordshire this evening most interesting case carbuncle three operations in three consecutive weeks swain is operator at five o'clock i shall be at the london bridge station until then gentlemen good day lawson the door dr jedd left his visitors to follow the respectable white cravatted butler and darted back to his consulting-room mr burkham and valentine walked slowly up and down burlington row before the latter returned to his cab i thank you heartily for your help said valentine to the surgeon and i believe with god's grace we shall save this dear girl's life it was the hand of providence that guided me to you this morning i can but believe the same hand will guide me to the end on this they parted valentine told his cabman to drive to the edgware road and in one of the churches of the immediate neighbourhood of that thoroughfare he gave notice of his intention to enter the bonds of holy matrimony he had some difficulty in arranging matters with the clerk whom he saw in his private abode and non-official guise that functionary was scarcely able to grasp the idea of an intending benedict who would not state positively when he wanted to be married happily however the administration of half a sovereign considerably brightened the clerk's perceptions i see what you want he said young lady a invalid which she wants to leave her home as she finds uncomfortable she being over twenty-one years of age and her own mistress it's what you may call a runaway match although the parties ain't beholden to any one in a matter of speaking i understand you give me half an hour's notice any morning within the legal hours and i'll have one of our young curates ready for you as soon as you're ready for them and have you and the young lady tied up tight enough before you know where you are we ain't very long over our marriages unless it is something out of the common way the clerk's familiarity was more good-natured than flattering to the applicant's self-esteem but valentine was in no mood to object to this easy-going treatment of the affair he promised to give the clerk the required notice and having arranged everything in strictly legal manner hurried back to his cab and directed the man to drive to the lawn it was now three o'clock at five he was to meet dr jedd at the station he had two hours for his interview with nancy woolper and his drive from bayswater to london bridge he had tasted nothing since daybreak but the necessity to eat and drink never occurred to him he was dimly conscious of feeling sick and faint but the reason of this sickness and faintness did not enter into his thoughts he took off his hat and leant his head back against the cushion of the hansom as that vehicle rattled across the squares of paddington the summer day the waving of green trees in those suburban squares the busy life and motion of the world through which he went mixed themselves into one jarring whirl of light and colour noise and motion he found himself wondering how long it was since he left harold's hill between the summer morning in which he had walked along the dusty high road with fields of ripening corn upon his left and all the broad blue sea upon his right and the summer afternoon in which he drove in a jingling cab through the noisy streets and squares of bayswater there seemed to him a gulf so wide that his tried brain shrank from scanning it he struggled with this feeling of helplessness and bewilderment and overcame it let me remember what i have to do he said to himself and let me keep my wits about me till that is done End of chapter one read by Celine Major.